Welcome to the 11th uh, John Seeley Brown Symposium on Technology and Society. I'm Tom Finholt, Interim Dean of the School of Information. Uh, this symposium is a highlight of our academic year. It exposes us to important thinkers and encourages discussion of interesting challenges at the intersection of people, information, and technology. In past years, we've welcomed such visionaries as Cory Doctorow, Shwetak Patel, Dana Boyd, Aza Raskin, Larry Lessig, and David Weinberg. The symposium is made possible since its start by the generous support of its namesake, John Seeley Brown. Uh, JSB's generosity has not only brought uh, great and stimulating speakers to campus, he's helped enhance UMSI's reputation at the national and international level. Unfortunately, JSB could not be with us today, but please join me now in thanking him in absentia for his continuing support. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, a few details. This talk is being webcast, so welcome to everyone watching at home, in their office, or at their local coffee shop. We're glad you could join us. We're also live tweeting this event, which you can follow at hashtag UMISHtalks. And the presentation will be available on our YouTube channel next week. Following the lecture, Lee Alexander will be taking some questions. We've provided index cards for you to write down your questions. We'll be collecting them, and we'll go through as many as possible. Uh, our colleague Christian Sandvig in, from Com Studies and School of Information will be moderating the question and answer session. In addition, I'd like to invite you to attend a panel discussion this afternoon in the Ehrlicher Room at North Quad with Lee and two other journalists, uh, Edouard Pan, a reporter with the independent French television channel Premier Ligne, and a current Knight Wallace Fellow, and Louisa Lim, a former Knight Wallace Fellow and NPR and BBC correspondent currently a visiting professor of journalism here at Michigan. Christian Sandvig will moderate their discussion on the enemies of information and memory. The participants will be sharing their own experiences with journalism under adversity and attempts to limit the freedom of information. Again, that's 2 o'clock this afternoon in 3100 North Quad. Since the subject of today's talk is video game culture, you may be interested to know that the University Library is sponsoring a gender and gaming symposium on October 24th from 10 to 4. The two keynote addresses will cover avatars for empowerment and diversity in digital games. You can find out more information and register at the library's website, lib.umich.edu. And now for today's speaker. Lee Alexander is editor-in-chief of Offworld, Boing Boing's counterculture game site dedicated to unsung voices and alternative movements in the field. As longtime editor-at-large for the game industry's news site, Gamma Sutra, she contributed game criticism, design analysis, industry trend editorial, and interviews with developers. In addition to columns and game specialist press outlets like Edge, Kotaku, and Polygon, her work has appeared in Slate, The Atlantic, The New Statesman, The Guardian, The New Inquiry, and the Columbia Journalism Review, Time, and other publications. She is the author of Breathing Machine and Clipping Through, two ebooks on tech and identity. She frequently speaks at schools, festivals, conferences, and other events on games for social good, often with a feminist lens. Please join me in welcoming Lee Alexander. Thank you. Wow, thank you very, very much for this amazing invitation. It, it's an incredible honor to be here. Um, thank you for the introduction uh, and for this awesome platform. It's the first time I'm actually an appropriate height to a podium, um, so that's, that's awesome for me. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm Lee Alexander. Um, I do write about and study video games and the people who make and play them. Um, I have been doing this for about nine years now, I think, which doesn't necessarily, that wouldn't necessarily constitute veteranship in, in some fields, but in mine, it, it makes me actually pretty old. <laughs> um, and I'm definitely among the longest serving women in my role, which I guess isn't necessarily something to be super excited about, but um, it is what it is. Is. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, I started out as a journalist for game developers, for the people who make games and, and who make the technology with which games are built. Um, I worked many years in, in various roles for Gamma Sutra mostly, which is basically the ugliest website in the world, but is, I think, certainly among the best resources for the people who work in games for a living. Um, this is the type of classic, hard-hitting um, headline that I contributed. Um, it is about a uh, <laughs> development engine technology 
partnership. Three cheers for procedurally generated tree modeling, yay. Um, <laughs> so, but my work mostly uh, would involve talking to game developers about the business and the technology and the culture of their work. Um, and I also did do consumer facing stuff. Um, even from the time that I started, I was interested in less known and weird games. Um, one of my first columns was about Japanese hentai games. Okay, um, and, and I was really interested in alternative culture. Um, I liked video games, I always have. I have played them since I was two years old. My father before me was a technology journalist. Um, but I never did get um, into the culture that tended to surround them. I didn't like the merchandise or the norms or the comment sections on video game websites. Um, and it was kind of my dream to like get quote unquote normal people to take video games seriously. Um, and. Uh, on that quest, uh, which you know sometimes had, sometimes successful, sometimes less so, um, I eventually entered more mainstream outlets, and now today I have my own venue, Offworld.com, which is part of Boing Boing, and my venue is just entirely alternative games culture. If you don't know what I mean by alternative games culture, don't worry, you will, I hope, by the end of this talk. Um, these days I do now mostly, I don't really even use the journalism word about myself because I, I mostly do subjective writing these days about my participation in the medium of games. Um, I write game criticism that's informed by my experiences and opinions and by the cultural reference points that I think are significant. Um, and I tend to personally prefer um, unique and individual and less commercial works over traditional traditional ones, um, this probably doesn't sound that strange to you because it's the same way that people will tend to develop their own vocabulary to talk about music or anything else that's creative. Um, however, my work has, and the way that I do it has made me and, and a lot of others the target of a hate mob, um, along with virtually every other person I know who writes about video games, uh, especially women. Um, this is the world we live in and, and, and work in now, unfortunately. Um, 2014 was a really ugly year for everyone in my line of work. Um, I actually had this plan that I would go to all of the like bootleg wikis and the weird conspiracy theory charts that these people make and, and all the parody Twitter accounts and, and show you some of the funnier ones. But as I started looking into it, I was like, wow, it's actually kind of bleak and awful. And I'm actually one of the least abused targets of the Gamergate thing. I assume you've heard of that thing, right? Has anyone not heard of it? You can go to Wikipedia um, if you haven't heard of it, but there are um, you know, coordinated campaigns underway to discredit and misrepresent and harass basically any woman who sticks her head above the line in my field. And sometimes it's a real buzzkill. Um, like I don't really enjoy speaking in front of people anymore. Like every time I go someplace to give a talk, they post about it um, and how they're gonna go bother me there. Um, and I makes me struggle to advertise my participation in events. Like, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so proud that the university invited me, but when they you know, tweet the location of, of the talk and they want everyone to participate on the hashtag, I ain't gonna look at that hashtag. Um, <laughs> I mean, they'll, they'll, those people will be there. I don't want them to harass the people who invite me places and things. Um, so every time that the university tweeted that I was coming, as enthusiastic I, as I was and as grateful as I have been for the invitation, you know, I, I feel a little bit worried often, if not, for my safety, at least for my basic comfort and dignity. Um, it kind of sucks, but I wonder if I can ever participate um, with thoughtless joy and curiosity ever again in my field. <laughs> but I still love what I do, I really do. Um, I didn't come here necessarily to talk about what I have personally been through with this stuff, um, so kindly be aware of that if you submit a question for the Q&A portion. Um, but in the course of this lecture, I will share um, a bit of, about the composition of this giant hornet's nest and exactly how and why I have kicked it, because I did kick it, and I'm gonna continue kicking it. So should we do like a warm-up kick? Ready? My field has a problem with women and race, and gender in general. I know, like everywhere. Um, but I assure you that games actually are kind of unique uh, in the type of crucible that they are. And I think that what's, understanding what's going on in games in general um, will help you anywhere in technology in terms of giving you an important health, uh, pathway to understand like broader landscapes um, of expression and identification. And hopefully by the end of this talk, what I really want to give you is an understanding of games and their players that goes beyond traditional perceptions. Um, a lot of people think that a game is a technology product um, or that games are a multi-billion dollar industry or even a potential new sport. Um, you know, it's more, I think it's important to see games uh, in larger ways than as like slot machines from science fiction movies or even as things mostly notable for their effects on society one way or the other. 
So to start with some background, um, games are a very, uh, a relatively young medium and industry, which makes them, for me, I think, a really interesting space to work in. There are people in my field now who were around before it existed, which you can't say about um, many things. Um, so as most of you probably know, they began with the arcades of the 70s and the home technology boom of the 1980s, when the idea of having technology in the home at all was fairly novel. Um, and then, of course, uh, the early 80s in video games saw a sort of market crash. Um, there was, it was caused by a cocktail of, of factors. Um, I think market saturation, there were some high profile um, uh, products that weren't very good and, and there was a poor understanding of supply and demand, I think. Um, I was like four, <laughs> but thankfully uh, home computers were able to become the early proving ground for uh, different types of game genres while the home console market corrected itself. Um, but that market crash had some long-term effects on the rollout of the video game industry as we know it in the West. Um, so this is a picture of an arcade in the 70s and you can see in this picture there's men, women, Girls, boys, adults, kids, it's, you know, all different types of people seem to be enjoying uh, this, this scenery. But by the time the 80s were finished, this was firmly established as the way to focus and to market video games, um, in part to recover the home technology market in the West. I think somewhere along the line, marketers must have had the idea that the best way to target these products was to double down on the idea of the audience for a luxury tech product being a young, relatively affluent white dude. Um, this is a Sega Saturn ad from about 1994 or so. Um, and the 90s were also when computers in the home exploded as a mainstream thing, like everyone had your Encarta Encyclopedia and stuff like that. Um, and the trajectory of companies like Apple uh, put forth into the public consciousness this very deliberate sort of geek shall inherit Narr narrative um, began around then when we started seeing computers become the way to be successful. Um, you know, boys who were shy and read fantasy novels in school suddenly now have a place to escape um, that was for them and, and a promise of success for qualities that were historically disfavored by a society. Um, and so this, common, this was a really common hero story of the 80s and 90s, the rise of a nerdy young man to power and pleasure. And it's no coincidence then that many video games around that time had a princess or a beautiful woman as your reward for achieving highly. Um, we also used, you know, combative and vengeful language like beating, you beat the game, you beat your opponent. And, and that vocabulary is still very much uh, a part of the commercial landscape today. Interestingly, though, Western video games and hardware would not really become significant in the commercial video game space until only about the last 10 years or so, this in, in, over the 2000s. It was Japanese games in general that were the most well-loved in the 90s, like big serial role-playing games, like Final Fantasy. Did anyone play Final Fantasy? A lot of, lot of people, great. <laughs> um, so I once heard a talk given by a couple of folks from Scandinavia about role-playing. Um, they were designers of live-action role-play experiences, and they made the point that the role-playing format in general is a distinctly American concept. You all start at level zero, you grind repeatedly at tasks, and you gain in excellence and wealth, you increase your number of statistics, and the only limit on this is how much time and effort you're willing to spend, and there's the presumption that everyone starts off equal. Um, by the late 90s, uh, this is same series later, um, games had advanced significantly in graphical power, and graphical power was, and, and in some places still is thought to be, the highest marker of, of quality and sophistication and artfulness. Um, and there was this hardware arms race that was on, um, many companies entering or trying to enter the home console market, and everyone would have a bigger controller with more buttons and more bells and more whistles than the last. Um, so this, the result of all of this was some rel relatively forbidding cultural trappings for video games. Um, whether they were determined by marketers intentionally or not. Um, so they're about the promise of capitalism, the journey of one special boy who wins a woman as a prize. Um, they were led by the demonstration of technological muscle, and they were relatively expensive to make as well as to own. Um, in the commercial sector, and again, this actually remains largely the case with video games, the PlayStation 4 launched, I think, at like $400, and development budgets of $100 million or more are regularly reported among top titles in video games. And I think $50 million is, is a pretty common budget for a competitive market competitive commercial video game from what I understand. Um, so here we have all these factors causing game, gaming to kind of calcify as something that your average person is going to view as easy to approach or as a casual hobby. Um, Casual is actually considered a bad word still in some circles of, of video game fandom. Like you can't participate unless you, you take it deeply seriously. They'll call you a filthy casual. Um, I personally, I don't like to say gamers 
and gaming because I think it's really exclusionary and I like to talk about players who play games. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there is a vocabulary and there is a lot of barriers to entry and a lot of economic and so social factors um, conspired to make video games be this thing that wasn't really for everybody. Um, and alongside all of this, of course, massive cultural suspicion of video games from outsiders. Um, the desire for realism and maturity in video games led to, there were a few uh, titles that thrived on graphic violence, but very few out of you know, the existing body of video games are exceptionally violent. Um, but the response to these was widespread moral panic, particularly from the conservative media. Um, it was common in the early to mid 2000s for these media headlines to worry that video games are too violent or they're causing young people to behave in depraved and antisocial ways or that they cause addiction and, and all this stuff that they're bad for you. Um, and in America, whenever we would read about a, sh a school shooting, the media would try to use video games as a scapegoat for the cultural factors in our youth culture that could, that could theoretically make someone do such a thing. Um, so that was happening. And that, so that this medium that many geeky young men saw as an escape valve or as a source of power and reward and eliteness, now under siege by more of the hated outsiders and by people who don't understand it. Um, a lot of games, I think, even pushed back further against this moral panic in response, like I think in, in some really interesting ways. The, uh, like the earlier Grand Theft Auto games, I think actually served as a good critique of the ways that American culture blames media for its ills. And they reveled in pushing back. They just made it grosser and more violent because of course video games don't make you kill people. You know, the very violence that Fox News claimed was destroying the youth, you know, that kind of violence became an act of protest, I think. Um, so most fans of commercial video games who are in my age range, and arguably ri rightly so, have deeply felt beliefs about free speech and about expression and against censorship. And as a result, unfortunately, they will not entertain much criticism or, or entertain the very idea that video games have social implications of any kind. And it is sort of understandable that the um, young, nerdy, affluent video gaming fan that had been catered to through the cocktail of factors that I've described so far, it's understandable he might st have started to develop a sort of persecution complex. Like here's his safe place where you know he understands the values, he's guaranteed the rewards, and here it is under threat by censorious outsiders who don't understand. And obviously, of course, the research has been done time and time again. There's so much research on games and behavior, um, and you can basically use all that research to make any case about games that you want to, but fundamentally, um, the links between video games and real-world violence and antisocial behavior dubious at best. Um, most studies you'll find, at worst, correlation in people who might have been as sensitive to either aggression or addiction already. So I was just last month one of the talking heads in a, uh, that's me, up top in 2015, BBC documentary, and it was called are video games really that bad? <laughs> and it, again, the documentary explored these supposed links that made references to violent games that are more than a decade old at this point. Um, so yeah, at the top is me uh, in the BBC in 2015, and in the bottom is me in 2008, reassuring people about Call of Duty. So I've been doing this circuit for years, and I guess I still haven't learned to do my roots for television. Um, so, <laughs> I, <laughs> although I definitely, be, I, I've doing, so I've been on TV doing this argument for years that video games are not going to ruin your mind. Um, and, and although I definitely feel that there are more marginalized and more persecuted populations out there in the world than young white American guys who own lots of video games, I can to some extent em empathize with their frustration at being misunderstood because this is my life's work also. Um, when I meet new people and I tell them what I do for a job, sometimes they're like, oh, do you, so you like, you play them? Do you actually play them? Like, do you ask a film critic if they watch movies? Like, and then I, I'm like, yeah, of course I do. And they're like, oh, like, aren't they? Wow, they seem really, you know, like there's a lot of prejudice that I encounter in my work. Um, and I know that they're looking at me like they think I'm just a secret baby that fiddles with my joystick all day. Um, <laughs> of course, there is so much more to this medium than these headlines, and, and that is what I came here to talk about, and, and we will get to that. But it is important for me to express that um, it can be, I know that it's tough when something that is broad and diverse and complex um, is widely misunderstood. Um, and I think it's understandable that video games became a field where the barrier, entry is, the barrier to entry is high on purpose. Um, Fans wanted protection from interlopers and misjudgments. It is understandable that people came to codify their participation through familiar symbols and internal language and the things that keep the hated outsider out of the clubhouse. Um, 
In the field of writing about games, uh, my colleagues and I, over the past decade or so, so if I started doing this in 06 or 07, the trend around that time, and, and in some circles, again, still is, um, we saw the public quest for legitimacy for games as our job. Um, you know, we were no longer going to perform as the glorified catalog printers of the 90s. We're going to be real journalists. You know, don't worry, we're, we're going to handle making video games respectable with our professional journalistical skills. Um, you're going to professionally deliver the facts to the consumer, and we're, and, uh, we're going to defend video games against all this ignorance, and, and we're going to write articles about how games are actually good for you and used in schools, and they're educational. And earlier in my career, I did do all of that stuff along with the others. Um, where the mi mainstream media was unfair, we were going to be fair and where the consumer was in this constant danger of being exploited by bad propositions and unscrupulous publishers, we were going to be objective and inform them you know, whether to buy the thing or not uh, and make sure they get their value for their dollar and all of that. Um, but in that way, I think we, uh, and by we I mean people who write about video games, games journalists, helped ratify the video game consumer as a prized and a special entity, um, you know, a special citizen that required our defense, uh, and games themselves as an unparalleled and private world that only the elite could appreciate and understand. Um, and so then if, if I do want to then start shifting and doing criticism, you know, to treat games as, the, as any art form might be treated, all art, art form has criticism, that becomes tough when my own audience has been raised, in part by me up till now, to dislike the very concept of criticism at all. Does that make sense? So as a, as a result, all told, these days, um, the ways that the rest of the world and even people elsewhere in technology think about video games remain pretty limited uh, in a way we failed to sort of connect the gaming community with the rest of the world. Instead, we isolated and coddled them. Um, but despite all the cultural gatekeeping that surrounds video games, um, I don't think people think as negatively about games as they used to, uh, which is good. Um, these days they say at least all half of players are women, and oftentimes the person who would hold her hands up and say, oh, I'm not really a gamer, if I start to talk to her for a little bit, eventually it turns out, you know, she does play games, or, you know, even if it's just Candy Crush in front of the TV, um, who here has played Computer Solitaire? Probably 100% of this room. Um, <laughs> like, it's, Computer Solitaire is the most played game of all time. It counts. It counts. Um, so people always ask me, why do I do what I do? What good are video games? What are they for? Um, and luckily I have the endless answers, like a good advocate ought. Um, so when Nintendo released its Wii, which it gets bodies moving with motion-controlled remotes, um, people were very excited about games' potential to contribute to physical health. Good. There's a lot of research to support the idea that games can make you a quicker thinker. Awesome. Uh, they can improve brain health for older folks, that's true. Um, and they can provide social activity for people who might otherwise be isolated. Awesome. Um, John Seeley Brown himself co-authored a paper on how watching the ways that players collaborate in World of Warcraft can teach us about teamwork and leadership in a professional space. Uh, Minecraft is basically the world's most beloved video games these days, um, and they actively encourage games like Minecraft actively encourage people of all ages to understand the relationships between things, to express themselves creatively, and to, to grow and nurture community. Um, no doubt you've also heard about esports, um, people on high-performance teams competing at video games on ESPN. ESPN, it's the future. Video game competitions, like global broadcasts of them. And then there is gamification, which is very exciting for Silicon Valley types. Um, theoretically, I think uh, gamification seeks ways to use game design concepts to make people feel um, rewarded, uh, to understand what motivates people and what makes them learn or achieve. Um, but I am personally pretty concerned about the potential for some of these concepts um, to sort of be kind of exploited because if I'm at work, instead of points and power-ups, uh, I kind of would like a raise in benefits um, and health insurance maybe. So I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't talk much about gamification in my work. Um, so moving on. Um, I think that there are ways of talking about games um, that we don't use enough um, the things that I've just mentioned don't even provide the whole picture. Um, I think that people feel guilty for playing for its own sake, so that we have to have all the modern conversations about the positive effects of video games, or what are they for, or can you prove that they have benefits or deleterious effects and all these things. Um, but 
we can't really, we never really discuss the validity of play for its own sake. Um, we never get past game as a thing that you buy um, or that has effects on you or that need defending against the consumer culture that lingers on it like a vile pile of Cheeto dust. Um, but supposing we try to think about games as a medium for human expression, um, for creativity and for communication. Um, supposing we truly consider games as a modern avenue for play in the sense that animals play in order to learn about themselves and the rules of their world and, and to experiment with those rules. In the real world, if you hit your sister in the face um, to see what will happen, uh, two things go on. There is a uh, consequence, like your mom yells at you. And there is a result that provokes empathy, like you look at her face and you see that you've made her cry. And the combination of these two things ideally teaches you not to hit your sister in the face. Um, or people in general in the face. Um, so imagine games as an opportunity, as, as, a, as a playful space that has that same opportunity to teach you. They can reward experimentation. They can express life and humanity. Any hitting that you do in the video game isn't actually gonna hurt someone. You can learn safely. Um, and when I say teach and learn, I don't actually mean, oh, this educational game commissioned by a nonprofit taught me about the energy crisis. Like educational gaming is a whole different thing. I just mean smaller moments than that. A moment when you receive, say, a new way of looking at the world or a moment when you fundamentally understood something that you could not otherwise have because it was presented to you in a system. In, an imaginary space where you felt safe to experiment and safe to fail. Games are spaces where I can go, what happens if I drive off the road? I mean, I think there's enormous potential there. And that, you know, the mind of a person who wants to find out if they hit that sign, will they knock it over? Like, it's, it's play, you know, play. See how the world works. Um, as illustrations of systems, um, games allow us to provoke or interrogate systems in ways that are more effective than having something explained to us. Um, they can be ways of understanding power structures. They can be ways of empathizing with the complex factors that create injustice. You know, it's not, a, not very effective always to explain to someone, well, this issue is complicated and that's why it's, it, there's no solution yet. But it can be effective to show someone the issue and all the moving parts. And when you put someone in charge of trying to solve something that is complicated, they understand it a lot better than if you just tried to explain it. Um, one of my favorite games in recent years is Papers, Please by Lucas Pope. Does anyone know this one? Oh good, a lot of you know it, awesome. Um, so you play a, a border, uh, border control guard in a fictional, fictional country. Um, it resembles an old Soviet bloc. There is war around you, there is potential terrorists, and your job is to sit in the booth and check documents. Literally, that is what the game is. It's about checking documents. Someone will come up to you with their identification card and their, and their passport and so forth, and you, you have to just make sure everything is accurate and that it matches. And the challenge of trying to manage different types of information is actually pretty fun. And as a player, you immediately note your own intellectual and emotional responses to being a component of bureaucracy. Like, if you, it's amazing. If you set a human being to stamping something, if I sit you down with a stamp, it's amazing how quickly and obediently we will sit there and stamp. We are, we're, we're made for it. Um, but the reason I really love this game is eventually you start to have to make decisions from one moment to the next. You have a starving family and you get paid based on the quota of travelers that you process every day. But in this deprived and war-torn area, everyone is desperate. Some people just are not gonna have their papers correct, and some people are refugees for, from horrible situations and have brought, hopefully, forged documents with them. Um, and some people might even be revolutionaries. You know, like, you're supposed to scan for weapons, but what if the weapon is on a good guy or someone that you think is a good guy? And uh, so all the tiny decisions that you make begin to express your values about this situation. Um, how much hope do you have or not have? Um, what do you think right and wrong is? Is it what the state wants? Is it what you want? You know, can you express yourself against the state while working in the context of a bureaucracy? It's really, really, really interesting. Um, each week in the game, things will change. Um, new rules and requirements are released or the political landscape shifts. Um, and now your relative moves in with you and you have another mouth to feed or it's your child's birthday and you just want to be able to afford to get him a crayon set, even if you turn another family away that day. Um, and thus the game poses questions of you continuously, and it makes statements continuously about who you really are within a complex ecosystem. I couldn't, it, I, that's something that I couldn't tell you what it feels like. I couldn't explain, you have to play the game, and the game can 
can cause you to experience that. Um, everything in the game is actually like really well made, feels tactile, like the papers feel like you can hear them crinkling and the stamps feel heavy and wet and this lo-fi bleak aesthetic really helps support the setting. Um, these are design decisions that, that really support the experience. experience. One thing that people often say is, well, the good thing about games is that they're interactive and they matter because you get a chance to affect the story and you are the one with the power. And I hate when people say that because it's so reductive. It's the minute to minute decision making within a system and the range of feelings that that can evoke. For me, it's not about having the power to control the story. Sometimes it's about what the experience of powerlessness is like. Um, Papers, Please is fictional, of course, but there are a lot of quite short games being made these days that use systems to critique systems. Um, a few months ago, Paolo Pedersini, he's a professor, um, released a tiny game called Boo Flag, and all it is is there is a, com a Confederate flag on the screen, and you boo into your laptop mic, and the louder you boo, the quicker the flag comes down, and eventually it catches fire, it says you win, very fireworks. That's the whole game. You just lean in and yell boo, and the louder you boo, the faster this flag comes down. Um, but in a few seconds, it is able to illustrate a point of view. The game suggests, obviously, booing at a Confederate flag and taking it down feels really good. It actually physically feels good to boo at the flag and to yell and boo and see something happening on the screen, but it does not con constitute a wider solution to racism and injustice in America. But it's short. It's a novel way of saying this. Um, it's funny. Um, and importantly, it's accessible. It becomes a bite-sized and playful way for you to share this message about someone else, and certainly easier than writing like a four-paragraph Facebook post, right? Um, here's another game designed by a pro professor called Pippin Barr. Um, he made a very small game called um, Real Baku 2015. It uh, was commissioned by, I think, a, a nonprofit organization to do it. So Azerbaijan is hosting the European Games as a distraction from massive human rights abuses there, like they were imprisoning activists and journalists and having this massive for sports festival there. Um, so in this game, you pick a competitive sports event, like you, you decide whether you're gonna play as like a journalist, an activist, I forget what the third category is, um, and, and you pick a competitive sports event like long jump or swimming, and then you have to do it in a jail cell. Of course, it's super bleak when the swimming consists of splashing around in your prison sink or uh, jumping around your cell and, and things like that. And you, the game does score you. It gives you points for as many how many times you can do that. Um, but obviously, the score is pointless because you are in jail. And obviously, the larger message there is that it's pointless to have a sporting comp uh, competition in the face of human rights abuses. Um, and this game... It takes only a few minutes to engage you on that issue, and suddenly, because you're attracted to play a game, you learned about something you didn't know before, or you know, you're able to, again, have a sort of complex world issue presented to you in a bite-sized and, and almost kind of light way. Um, this game is called Passengers. It's by Francois Alliot and Arnaud Dubac, and in it, um, you play as a smuggler of migrants during the um, ongoing refugee crisis in Europe. So why would you want to play a smuggler? Those people are awful. Well, because by making the choices that smugglers make, you know, so basically the passenger will come up and it gives you some, it gives you a few pieces of information. It, it tells you the person's name, it tells you their job, um, if they have family or someone with them or not, and then how they treat you, which I think is really interesting. Like, you know, maybe you know, the person who's pleading with you or the person who won't look you in the face, you know, like you have to decide whether to let them on the boat or not. And the more people you let on the boat, the more hazardous your journey becomes, um, the more lives you're likely to lose. Um, you can increase or decrease how much you're gonna charge them to get on. And you very quite quickly start to see the issues in a new way when you are quite literally weighing the cost of human life, like who you think deserves to live the most and why. And the purpose of this is, is not to trivialize life or to make you emphasize, empathize with a smuggler, but the more you, the player, do this, the more it drives home the fact that every person getting on these boats has an individual circumstance. Um, and that makes it harder for me as an American person or as an American living in the UK to just think of them generally as a faceless group of statistics. Um, I think it's amazing this game was made for a jam uh, in a weekend, and uh, it was, I think, a really cool and effective way to provoke conversation on the crisis.
So one thing about all of the games that I have showed you actually defy everything that I explained to you is valued by traditional game culture. So where historically video games have been expensive and demanding of skill and money and time, uh, and they were designed for the power and the pleasure and escapism of an affluent young white male audience, and increasingly we're starting to see the opposite coming from this new world. Games that use just a few keyboard buttons or a mouse, um, you can just download them onto your computer. Um, they have a lo-fi uh, handmade aesthetic. They take only just a few hours or a few minutes, and they're inexpensive or free. For me, the de this defiance of traditional values is the most important thing that has happened in video games for as long as I've been in them, maybe even ever. Um, it is being made possible thanks primarily to the democratization of tools. Um, in the past few years, one big thing that has happened is that there, have been, um, there has been a proliferation of free and low cost, easily available game development tools with lower barriers to entry than, than creative uh, tools have traditionally had. Um, and then there are also the platforms on which you can independently release those things, um, things like Steam or even the App Store. Uh, you no longer have to have no choice but to go through a traditional retail channel. Um, people can now independently release games that they've made themselves without relying on those commercial retail channels and associated marketing. Um, and the ability to make video games used to be locked behind the specialized gate of, for example, a computer science degree uh, and the financial means to, avoid, uh, to afford the materials. There's now countless, countless free and low cost tools available and online community around those tools to teach everybody and to learn best practices. So it's feasible for someone who's never, you know, never played a video game before to go online and learn how to make one, which is extraordinary, um, theoretically. Um, importantly, lots of these tools, uh, many of them at least, bypass the need for technical skills like coding, uh, which as we know are historically heavily gatekept. Um, you know, diversity in the tech industry is impossible. Um, so this democratization of tools makes it possible for the first time for people who are interested in this stuff to start unraveling the traditional insular bounds that have uh, kept them out of video game culture. Uh, and this has been so especially for women and especially for marginalized women. Um, just one example of this has been Twine, does everybody know about Twine already? A lot of people are nodding. Twine is a free tool that allows people to make text games without the need to learn to code. Um, they can be simple choose your own adventure style uh, text games or you could do more sophisticated or unusual things um, with text. Um, even I can make them. <laughs> so I make the people that I love, these little tiny playable greeting card size games about our inside jokes or whatever, a person to person exchange of games, which is brand new and awesome and someone, for someone like me who does not have technical skills. Now I can use games to communicate with someone I care about. Um, and, and given that I do that all the time, it is tough for me to go around the world and think of people still think of video games as like expensive retail products that you get at GameStop or whatever. Um, so an interesting thing happens when you democratize tools and level a playing field. Um, when people who have been turned off for years by sexism and hyper-capitalism and special nerd clubhouse nature of video games, when they start being able to come to the table, you have works that actually focus on the voices and experience of like historically marginalized people. Um, I'm saying there are like lots of games by trans women, games about trauma, games about mental health, um, games about things like empathy, caregiving. Um, people who generally have had a hard time being represented or listened to in games and technology finally use games, can finally have a voice through games and can use it to speak about their lives. Um, this game here that I'm showing is by Ariel Grimes and it's called What Now? It is free to play in any browser and it requires only the arrow keys. It's one of my recent example, my favorite recent examples of what games can do with personal experiences and very little, uh, you know, there's only four buttons, like a very easy barrier, very easy to play. Um, so you play a character, which I assume is some version of Ariel, um, and all you do is you, you guide the character around her room, and she describes the things that she encounters in her room and the feelings that she has about them. Um, what makes the game interesting is that your field of vision is actually very narrow in this game. You can't see very far in front of you, and the character walks very slowly with these heavy, crunching steps. So you're you know, controlling this narrow and uncomfortable field of view as you try to see and interact with things in, in Ariel's room. Um, and if you push her too far, if you hold the button down or try to walk too fast, the screen will begin to show these glitch effects and you must stop. Um, her journal gets harder for you to read. So if you go at a pace that's other than hers, you know, you, you have some experience of distress showing in this interface. Um, 
And if you keep pushing on the keys and you don't listen and, and the field of vision gets narrower and narrower and the words on the screen convey the character's sense of panic and sensory overload to you. Um, and so if you want to see all of her room and learn about her and the tools that she uses to cope, you have to kind of just inhabit that fricative and uncomfortable space with her and, and take your time. This is not a game that's fun to play. Um, but it is the creator's way of letting you know what it is like to be her sometimes and, it, and her way to creatively express what emotional overwhelm feels like to her and, and how small and safe places that are your own can become frightening. And you as the player, hopefully, when I played it, you know, hopefully you think about what it's like for you to give and receive care. You know, do you, do you help people on your own terms or, or, or on, on theirs? You know what I mean? Like with just a small window and four keys, you think about how you take care of the people in your life and whether, you know, the terms on which you let them share themselves with you. Um, so there are a lot of these games now about another person's pr perspective and about unspoken experiences of, of trauma or pain. Um, but they don't always have to be down in the grit or so sad, so to speak. Um, one of my friends made a twine game about imagining what what if you were playing Dungeons and Dragons with Vin Diesel and he was your DM? I mean, he loves Dungeons and Dragons, so it could happen. Um, like, what would it be like? The game is what, it, what would it be like to play D&D with Vin Diesel? And it's him just like telling you what the different monsters are and telling you why he likes role playing. And um, it's lighthearted and brief. And you actually kind of finish the game feeling like you have made friends with Vin Diesel. Um, <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, she made that game because she wanted to create a little space that would make people smile and feel good. Like someplace you can go when you're sad. Well, Vin Diesel's here, man. He's going to play D&D &D with you. You know, it's awesome. So when I was a kid, if you said the phrase games about caregiving, I would assume you meant like a pink Tamagotchi or like a Nintendog that you feed. But caregiving and consent among bodies and, and issues of communication and partnership is another really important area where independent game makers are starting to explore. Um, one of my favorite game makers right now is called Robert Yang. Uh, he does work that is primarily about masculinity and bodies. Um, he just made a very strange and interesting game called Rinse and Repeat, which is about showering with a hunk at the gym. Like it's after your exercise class and some guy that you've had your eye on comes in. Oh, you're a guy and some guy that you've had your eye on comes in and he wears sunglasses in the shower. And he like wants you to like help get his back. And he calls you bro and pal and you erotically wash this guy for a fixed amount of time. And then you can't do it again until the next day. After, after class, the game then decides what time your class is. And so between days that you play this game, you have the experience of being like, oh man, I wonder if that guy that I showered with is gonna be at the gym again. And, and so <laughs> he's, he's built a, a con an emotional condition into the mechanics. He's using technology to talk about feelings and experiences in a way that isn't preachy, but allows you to inhabit and think about you know, collaboration and space and your body and this person's body. Um, and I really like this game that he also did called Cobra Club. Um, you play as a gay guy taking penis selfies in the era of public surveillance. Um, I think it's really interesting. It has a lot to say both about you know, self-image and surveillance. Um, and he also made a kink game called Hurt Me Plenty about like consensual hitting like in a sexual way. Um, but his games are basically about the ways that we choose to share ourselves with others um, and the social implications when, let's say, for example, you're both men and there's a vulnerable quality to his work that I really like. It is not pornographic or titillating, but it's fun and sexy and mature in a way that commercial video games, I think, are generally not. And um, so these are just a couple of examples literally off the top of my head. I could have made the whole talk just examples of these games, works that um, represent this massive shift in values um, in the things that people are able to do and to say with the form. Um, th there is a market for new kinds of creators and new ideas. And even if there isn't a market financially, you know, whenever I talk about these people go, well, who's going to buy that? Maybe nobody. Maybe it is valid, in, you know, just inherently valid. Um, you know, you're not going to maybe make a living off your five-minute game about trauma, but game making and expressing yourself through the medium of games is an inherently valid thing to do. Games are valid, and it's because people can use them in this way. And, and this new type of validity is possible because of new people feeling welcome at the table, first quietly and then with a roar. So um, I did something 
that caused thousands of furious people to petition my employer's advertisers and to send me death threats and to stalk all of my personal things online and make up weird lies about me and have caused me to fear speaking in public. And now I worry that my entire long service to games criticism is going to be forcibly reduced to people asking me questions about cyberbullying. Um, what I did was I wrote this article um, which suggested that this new and meaningful use for games that I've described might be more important than the old way. I said that the idea of gamer as a very special market category in a very special high-end treehouse was no longer relevant. Um, and I urged game developers, the people with the ability to create these experiences, to stop catering so much to the power fantasies of traditional audiences with their repellent trappings, and, and to diversify their teams, and to welcome and respect women and marginalized people and multiracial creators, because they are clearly doing the most interesting work right now, um, and to help video games finally grow up a bit. Some of them, not even all of them, some of them grow up finally a bit, um, and not just be a toy for nerds, and not just be a multi-billion dollar industry, or a technology product with supposed effects, positively or negatively, but valid for its own sake inherently. Um, yes, it was mean that I called people nerds, but the reaction to this was as if I had killed somebody. Um, the very idea that games could be bigger than simply tech product, product targeted at a narrow and specific audience was so upsetting to people that they did everything in their power to suggest that it was an unethical idea. Like I should somehow be disqualified from writing about games unless I could get back in line and just tell people what to buy and put a score on it and keep my hysterical female feelings out of it. Um, so when my colleagues started to do feminist criticism of games, which all art has, um, even just to look at the way women or people of color have been historically represented in our field, and when we wanted to have conversations about our social and professional value in this space, we were seen as the same kind of censorious shrews that had been offended by Grand Theft Auto. They believe that we are coming to take away all the fun toys and to cover up all the boobs and that we sit in front of screens with a notepad being like, nah, boobs too big, cross them out, cover them up. No, not enough women, throw it away. Like They think that's what we do um, and that we won't stop until we destroy everything. Um, that, that is what they think. I mean, probably I feel as if the 100th game about Batman and his friends or the 100th game about killing wizards on the moon um, represents a flatter and a more sanitized world than one where women and marginalized people get to make games about sex and trauma and dick pics. But, you know, we're, I guess we're the ones who want all the censorship. <laughs> um, so the status quo is terrified of the very idea of alternatives to the status quo. And they will make up whatever excuse they can think of to fundamentally lose their shit at people in defense of the status quo. Um, even when their arguments don't make a lot of sense. Um, like these attackers are so furious about the potential fictional censorship of video games that they have created a world where women are frightened to say much on Twitter or to speak in public. And I'm not really sure that's how anti-censorship is supposed to work, uh, don't think. Um, and again, I was only one of many women um, bearing the brunt of a full-blown temper tantrum from the old guard, who, by the way, will definitely still get the commercial games that they love made for them year after year without end. So what, why is this relevant, what's happening here? What can we learn from this sad, weird backlash? What does it teach us about the culture of technology and the pace and the shape of change? Because the locus of power, ideally, is not only shifting in games, but elsewhere in tech, right? You know, everywhere you look, you see people finally starting to make efforts to make the keys to the castle acceptable, um, accessible to new, al uh, new talent and non-traditional audiences. Um, everybody wants a kid, their kid to learn to code now. Every kid, all of them. That's the big thing. There's hackathons for eight-year-olds, and we think we can solve poverty and world hunger and socioeconomic oppression by teaching everyone to code. But important shifts do not come only from having tools. The sort of culture war for the identity of video games is happening only because of what creators want to say with those tools. I believe that you cannot uncouple technology from social issues, that you couldn't have a world where tools became democratic or the status quo was disrupted, but it had nothing to do with feminism, though. You know, the reason why diversity on teams or diversity in tech matters is not arbitrary or quota-based, but it's because you don't really realize how many modes of expression exist outside of the dominant paradigm until you shake that dominant paradigm hard. To shift anything from product to cultural object, you have to dismantle the social status quo around it. Yes, of course, let's teach our kids to code, but also what about teaching them to culturally disrupt? 
or to create a revolution in self-expression, or to create space for people who have traditionally not had any space. And what about teaching them to be prepared to weather the consequences of that righteous disruption? Um, this very trite, hypocritical sort of right-wing backlash where there are like salacious Breitbart hit pieces about every progressive figure in video games right now. Unfortunately, that is their MO. That's what they're gonna do to everyone everywhere. And those are the type of tactics that we have to expect around anything that we do that is genuinely progressive. Um, I think one major information technology concern in the coming decade is going to be how do we protect ourselves and our personal lives online from exploitation? Should we ever try to do anything disruptive? And and I think that what women in games have been through in, in the last year is, is gonna offer a lot of lessons about that. So our simple, beautiful goal to create space for technology to be humane and equitable with validity for the work of all, that's not gonna be easy. Um, the people in power are going to fight you. Uh, maybe you are the person in power and you feel a little uncomfortable right now because you haven't yet learned to challenge your own internal resistance to justice. We've all been there. But the culture war in games, I believe, offers a roadmap for everyone in this room, no matter where in tech you work. It will teach you to notice where the revolutions are going to be sparking off in your own field. Look for those who have traditionally held all the power, or who set all the values, or who make all the rules, and figure out what might scare them. Look for wherever there are white guys who are mad, and help the people who are making them mad. Beware. Watch out for the person who thinks that the word objectivity is always preferable to the word empathy. Beware the person who says client and product instead of person and idea. This has to be, progress for us has to be about more than throwing money at internet harassment or teaching coding to kids in the inner city. Find the guys who talk over you and undermine you and misrepresent you and fight them in whatever way you can, whether that is through what you create or by helping someone else um, create, or like me, just writing really ranty editorials on the internet and attracting fire. <laughs> um, so basically, all of this that I've spoken about is what is interesting about the video game space for me right now. Um, it is not, I'm not interested in you know, what games can be used for, I mean I am, but it's less interesting to me to talk about gamification or social good or the positive neurological effects or, or any of those things. I believe ultimately that video games as a form are broadening in scope so much that we can still have pioneering, fantastical, technical marvels, wildly profitable works at one end, and then revolutionary, anti-capitalist, short, accessible works of human expression at the other end. We can have our commercial garbage and we can have our you know, creative and, and spiritual stuff. What matters the most to me is that we consider these works good enough and important without having to prove their worth or their positive effects. You know, I've told you what some of them can do. Isn't it enough that the definitions of what games can mean and who they can be for and who gets to make them for whom are just exploding? Isn't it amazing that we can have an actual cultural revolution in the technology of the way that, that human beings play? Um, I think so. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm so grateful for this invitation, for the work of everyone here um, bringing me over, treating me so wonderfully. A special thank you to Dean Finholt, Todd Stewart, Heather Newman. Um, if you're interested in revolutionary feminist video games, please visit offworld.com. It's the website I run with my amazing colleague, Laura Hudson. Um, if you want to tell me about your own games or technology products, projects for potential coverage, or if you want to hire me at, at a consult, as a consultant, this is my um, contact info. And I think now we have to do the questions. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. My name is Christian Sandvig. I'll be your moderator. We have a brief amount of time for questions. I've been passed a few cards. We have staff in the aisles who are collecting additional cards. If you have questions, please pass them to the aisle. Um, so the first question, um, why did you decide to stop identifying yourself as a journalist and do more subjective work? Um, I, th I, I covered it a bit in the talk that I believe that the talk about being a serious journalist who does objective things is, I think, uh, correlated value-wise with kind of the old way of doing things. I think it promotes, I don't want to be distant from my work. I want to see it as a human and a cultural thing. And um, using the word journalism, I think, sets up, I mean, I'm, I'm, obviously, I'm, you know, cultural journalists are still journalists, but, you know, I think using the big J word is like, A, waving a flag in front of gamer gate bulls, and B, sets up expectations of 
I'm not really doing reporting. I'm not exposing any truths. I'm just writing what I think about stuff. Thank you. So, um, uh, have you ever gotten very emotional about a game event? I guess an in-game event. Oh yeah, I, get, I, I cried about a game yesterday. Can you describe it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just wrote an article on Offworld.com. It should at this moment be the header. Um, this is a game called Wheels of Aurelia, and it's about two women on a road trip on the Via Aurelia in Italy in 1979. And um, basically, one of the you just met this woman, and you're kind of together, um, but. As you drive, your car, you drive a car with one hand and have a conversation with the other. And um, it's kind of about the kind of emotions that can come out on a road trip. And uh, basically, one of, the, one of the, you know, you pick up hitchhikers, you talk to people, and anything can happen when you're on this road. And every time you play the game is different. And basically, there was a really beautiful moment in which um, one of the characters said something uh, to me that I hadn't known about her before, even though I played the game a few times already. And I was really touched by it. So yeah, I get emotional constantly about games. <laughs> But I also like cry thinking about Pixar's Inside Out, so. <laughs> um, so another question we have is, um, what is your advice for thriving in a white dude dominated video game community as a woman or a minority, both short term and long term? Do you reckon that I'm thriving? Um, <laughs> it's tough. Uh, the best advice that I can give is to protect yourself, um, be ready. You do not have to read every comment. When they come for you, you don't have to answer. You can turn, like, I know just shut it off is not helpful advice for people who live and work on the internet, but you can take measures to insulate yourself. Like, I'm, for example, I'm sure that everything went fine, but I'm not gonna look at the conference hashtag in case they found it while I was speaking, because I know that might happen. And I know, you know, know yourself, know when you're comfortable and when you're upset and keep yourself comfortable. Um, when I go to large conferences and I feel socially overwhelmed, I don't mind asking someone to come with me because I don't know if someone coming up to me quickly is gonna be, is really excited to meet me or is gonna yell at me. Um, so yeah, protect yourself, be prepared, and you do not have to you don't have to engage it. They will make you feel as if you have to engage them. Like, what, no answer for my accusation that you're actually really corrupt and, you know, just because, you know, no answer to the, yeah, no, no answer, F off. You're like, you can say no, you can refuse to engage it and you have to protect yourself. So we actually have a number of uh, questions that are on the same theme that I will try to summarize. Okay. Um, it's basically, what do you say to people who argue that since the 1980s, we've seen a great diversity of characterizations, narratives, and types of games, and this is progress. There's, yeah, of all, there's a bunch of examples as well. F FIFA, 16, so. Yeah, of course. I mean, moderate progress in the commercial sector is not good enough for me, but nonetheless, it's still happening, and it's cool. I think, you know, I feel like looking at the commercial sector for progress, though, is like looking at the Pope for liberalism. You know, everyone's like really watching the new Pope, and they want to see what he's going to do for left-wing causes, and you know, he's, he's the Pope, though. You know, and l looking at Tomb Raider for a positive representation of woman, it's like, cool, well, I'm glad that they're actually making a real effort to um, develop a genuine backstory and a character for Lara Croft, and they've put some more clothes on her, so that means she's respectable now. And, um, you know, but fundamentally, I'm not, that's not where I'm going to celebrate and wave my flag, the moderate progress made by commercial products. Um, so another question we have is... Um uh, do you think that uh, evangelizing the positive potential for video games is consistent with serious video game criticism? Um, yeah. What is serious? I can't be excited and, and sincere at the same time. I, I, I would be curious about what serious means. Um, evangelizing potential isn't the same as... See, we, we still haven't uncoupled the concept of my work from the... You know, I'm not here to sell products. Like, I'm not, used to be that enthusiasm for video games was suspect because journalists might be, you know, associated with the marketing of the product. But um, I don't have an agenda other than to be enthusiastic about things I like. Um, and I take my work seriously. Maybe not, I don't think I take myself too, I, I try not to take myself too seriously. So, yes, I think I'm doing serious uh, games criticism. And I also think that I am uh, putting forth a, uh, messages about what I think is valuable about the medium, and I don't think that those two can be mutually exclusive. So we also have several questions on a theme that I'll try to summarize here. Cool. Um, uh, if tools have been democratized, do other areas of gaming need democratization? Distribution, question mark. Uh, another person writes, um, 
um, how, how, do ensure that, how do we ensure that these alternative views are actually seen or heard? Another question is, is, are there platforms that are needed to continue to empower alternative perspectives? That is a really good question and, and it has a really important answer. Curation is essential. Our platforms are utterly saturated right now. It is impossible to find new work. Um, that's Part of what I try to do is dig up things for people and put them on my website, but you know that's not enough, and that doesn't make people spend money. When you read about ten games a day that cost a dollar, you know you might only buy one of them, if any. Um, so, the de yes, that is a challenge, given that you know the the earning potential is low and the platforms are very crowded, and so there do need to be solutions. Um, you know, Steam has a curators program where you can follow people on Steam that have tastes that you like, but even then. Um, it's still, it's still really tough. And I think what's really needed to continue to um, proliferate marginalized voices is um, more dedicated platforms, more organizational platforms, and better ways to help people find um, alternative perspectives. So there's two questions that have a theme that ask you about your view of the future. Uh, oh. One of them says, five years ago, did you expect this freedom of expression in games to be as widespread as it is? Are you optimistic the next five years will continue to grow in, in inclusivity? Five years ago, um, I could have never imagined this. I, uh, I didn't conceive of video games as anything other than something that you bought in a package that was made by you know, a traditional games developer. I didn't know that this could happen. I couldn't have imagined it. So that makes it hard to prognosticate um, you know, what's going to come next. I, I don't tell the future, but I mean, I, I have remained in my, in my work at you know, some personal cost um, because I care so much about it and because even at times when it's hard, in spite of that, I can't wait to see what happens. Yes, I'm optimistic. In other artistic arenas, artistic uses of the medium aren't especially threatening to the commercial powers that use that medium. Why is it different with video games? I don't think that it is threatening. I, I don't know why it's perceived as threatening. I think because of the cultural factors I describe, yeah, the commercial games industry is gonna continue onward and, and, and probably not change very much. So the, the games that our enemies really love are gonna still you know, keep being made. Um, and yeah, I think because of the cultural factors, um, they believe that it's theirs. They believe that the medium is theirs and that the culture around it should be theirs and controlled by them. And they identify with games or with game brands so strongly that any perceived participation by new people is uh, suspect and, and a sign of a threat. Um, but in, in, in truth, the you know, new forms of expression and new forms of create, creation and new non-commercial uses don't threaten the commercial sector materially at all, I don't think. Can you say more about your view of games as a basis for learning, for example, Katie Salen's work? in New York City. Yeah, um, I was actually just I was t speaking about that with Barry Fishman this morning over breakfast. Um, I think games have enormous potential for learning the same way that, you know, we learn through play and when you have systems and paths to make choices and, and receive responses, I mean, I mean, absolutely, yeah, I love Katie Stanton's work and I love, um, I love the potential there. I think, you know, if you're, if you're interested in that, I'm all for it too. But uh, I'm not an academic person and so I don't, I don't have access to like actual impact studies on, on any of those things. So I, I think our final question due to time constraints will be, you mentioned the desire to have a professional video game journalism. How would you evaluate the average piece of journalism about video games compared to other kinds of journalism? Um, I think what the questioner really wants me to say is that our standards are lower. Um, the quality of writing in video games has been slower to develop, I think, because Again, it's such a young medium. We've still been trying to figure out what our audience wants and what's the best way to do it. And, and it's changed so much over the years. Um, like, you know, there are only a few people working in video games who have traditional journalism degrees at all. Um, we, there's been efforts to do reporting on, like, for example, work conditions at game studios. I've done some of that. They've done some of that. Um, but it's really still kind of a wild west in terms of what audiences respond to. And, you know, it... Uh, we're all gonna like have our jobs taken away by YouTubers who are just like yelling over Counter-Strike anyway, so. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Lee Alexander. Thank you so much. You guys have been great. I really appreciated the questions. Thank you.